There you go. Thanks a lot. No problem. Um, so uh, I did receive um, five of the letters uh, and I downloaded them just a couple of seconds ago. Um, as you know, that's uh, the end result for our project for the uh, our reading and conversations, discussions, and your sets of quotations. You know, everything was leading up to the letter, my education. And please keep in mind that Thursday, we are doing a reading of your letter. And the situation is kind of um, um, described in the rubric, right? That you have here in the Raise Your Hand forum. This is what I posted for you to see. So if the letter is going to be late, I said, I will take 10 points off, but I will accept it. Um, but the, the thing is this Thursday, right? Um, as part of the uh, work for the class, you're, you, I'm asking you to do a paper report, which is nothing major. What I, my intention here is for us, you know, to listen to you and to ask you two questions about the letter you wrote. So notice uh, how simple this, this is in, in the end. It says, uh, select a paragraph that, that you're going to read, but this must be uh, like a main point that you're making, right, throughout your letter. But I, I could also say, select two paragraphs. Feel free, you know, um, just to read, share with us to, to, to a section that is important, but nothing lengthy, okay? And then, I'm going to try my best to ask you a question, just, and then I will ask you, also the rest of the audience for the day, to ask yourself another question. And the idea is that you are going to explain to us what you wrote, your ideas, um, maybe expand on what uh, you got to say, but it's actually sort of a conversation about what you wrote, okay? Uh, this Thursday, basically that. So it's, I don't think it's a lot of pressure. On the contrary, if of course, if you're done now, right, and you submitted your letter, you just are ready. Uh, you just have to make a decision about what is it that you're going to read. Any questions about that? Um, I'm wondering, did, did you get my letter? I got all that were submitted, yes. Okay, I just want to make sure because they were, yeah, they were right there, you know, in the in the little box that I put together for you to submit. All right. So yes, the answer Thank is you. no problem. Okay. I'm just realizing this now. Um, I did not. I missed over the part of four full pages. I did have like four pages, but it wasn't a full fourth page. Do you want me to like? fix it and then hand it back into you. You can do that. Yeah, you can do okay. that. say yes, you can do that. Thank you. No problem. Um, let me see. So where am I? I'm gonna stop sharing. So let's uh, come back then to uh, today's uh, uh, poetry by Martin Espada. Uh, we left uh, with, uh, when we were already uh, going over a few poems by Martin Espada, the Puerto Rican poet, uh, born in Brooklyn. And I said, part of his biography was that he became a, a lawyer, first of all. And if you go to his website, you'll see that uh, it says he was a tenant, tenant, lawyer working for mostly uh, it, lots of, uh, you know, uh, the la Latinos, lots, lots of Latinos, the Latino, the Latino Im immigrant population near Boston, I guess. So he visited many times, um, many locations because of his, uh, his duties as, as a lawyer. And then uh, later on, he became a professor of at uh, one of the you know uh, of, of English la literature, but he's always actually been teaching um, translation 
poetry and, and making a connection between the poetry uh, written here in the States with two, po two poetry uh, uh, written in Spanish in Latin America. And in particular, he has always said that the poetry by the Chilean poet Pablo Neruda has been very important uh, for what he does. And he's translated poetry by, by Neruda and many other, a number of, uh, of, writers, uh, of writers from Latin America. He's got a collection of um, translations of poetry from, by poets from Latin America. He's not the only translator, but he's the um, editor and, and the, the, that's his book, you know, uh, with the help of several translators. Um, so there is a connection between this Latino person and Latin America. There's a connection between Spanish here, as you know already, and, and English. And there is a, uh, an important uh, dimension of his, uh, what is it, uh, of himself. Because for, for, for uh, Martin Espada, um, being Puerto Rican is important, but uh, what does it mean, right? For, for different people, maybe for different Puerto Rican people, it may mean something slightly different. So as we read his poetry, maybe we are finding out more about the way he understands being Puerto Rican here in uh, this side of the country and growing up Puerto Rican in New York, Brooklyn, right? And mostly uh, speaking, I guess, English and being educated uh, formally, right? Have, receiving an education in English as it happened, you know, in the case of uh, Richard Rodriguez. So um, that's, that's in a nutshell, you know, um, sort of a little biographical context for what we are doing here in terms of reading this poetry. Now, for today, we had um, the starting page for us was page 50 in the book Alabanza. And again, if you are interested in finding out why he titled Alabanza, the, the book, right, Alabanza, and you may go to the glossary at the end of the, the book. And also you may go to the end of the book and read the lengthy poem uh, title is Alabanza, okay? The very last poem in this book is called Alabanza. Uh, but, so, the, 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 I wanted to ask you a question, and the question is, uh, since we have read already a few poems by, um, by Espada, um, why do you think he's interested in writing uh, poetry? Or a second question, what kind of poetry is he writing, Jaylin? Um, in which section is it? I forgot. And I think it's the first section, I believe. Maybe the second, no, it's the second section and I believe the third section. He talks about like um, farm workers, labor workers and the treatment that they get, um, non-equal pay, non-equal like uh, working conditions not stable, I guess, is a better word. Those uh, types of, um, he uses, uh, it's, I'm sorry, I can't speak today. Uh, he uses that to write his poetry. Yeah, that's, that's very important, I would say, because we have, uh, we have a good number of poems that pertain to, to workers. Um, even, I would say, you know, people trying to get a work, uh, a job. So, unemployed people. Um, and so this is a, uh, this is a portrayal, not necessarily, of, not necessarily always uh, of middle-class people, but we have it also in, in the book. Um, yes, uh, many, many poems by Espada will focus on the experiences of workers, workers. Um, which may be kind of unusual, okay? But there is a side of uh, American poetry that uh, also work, uh, uh, focuses on the lives of the working class, of the working class, working class people. So yes, indeed, that's very important. Anything else? Why does he write poetry? 
what kind of poetry does he write? Um, Kels. He writes the poetry that tells uh, somewhat of a like story. Thank you for saying that. Yes. Um, and let me contrast that, what you just said, to a different kind of poetry. Um, uh, people may, poets may enjoy, enjoy writing uh, um, poetry that uh, it's sort of um, very playful with language. And that is to say, uh, they, they want to work a lot with the language they, they and kind of creating a game uh, with words. Uh, it could go into a puzzle of words. But in here, what is interesting about this poet in particular is that he is creating at times, yes, it's telling you a story. And if that is the case, then we have sort of a beginning of the story, a middle of the story, an end to the story. But also what we have in many of these poems is conflict. So we have like in the um, place that we were examining at the beginning of the class, we have one, um, what was it? Because if we have to have, for us to have a conf conflict, we have to have at least two forces going against each other, clashing, clashing against each other. So if you have a story, my, my, I would argue that you need, you need to have a conflict and then you have force A and force B, and then maybe you have a climax and then maybe you have a resolution. Indeed, for you to, to write poetry that will be narrating a story, as he does, I think we need to have a resolution, okay? An ending to the conflict. Um, so yes, um, and my point at the beginning when we started uh, reading his poetry was to say, um, that makes it very accessible, okay? Don't fear poetry. And I'm, uh, I am saying this because I've gotten many comments by, by students saying to me, but, you know, poetry, it's, it's kind of difficult to grasp. In the end, there are too many interpretations, interpretations. So what I'm saying is, this is a way, of, in, in case you, you like uh, a poem he wrote, that's the way to begin to like poetry. Uh, and then you can start exploring more, you know, and reading more. There are so many uh, wonderful Latinx um, writers in, in uh, nowadays, poets. There are so many poets. There are so many people writing poetry nowadays in, in the States. Uh, there's wonderful translations into English um, or poetry written in many, many languages. So there is a lot that you can explore. And if the poetry by Martin Espada will help you, will be kind of the bridge, you know, for you to to cross the bridge over to, to that side of poetry, you know, <laughs> that would be one of my goals. Um, not everybody has to write the same way, right? But this is the specifics of Martin Espada. And many poets share his uh, approach to poetry, okay? He's not unique in telling uh, stories. He's not unique in, in, in writing about uh, the working class. And of course, about the life of a Puerto Rican person, the way he sees it. Okay, because I'm not saying here that every Puerto Rican person again or poet will see life or life experiences in the same way that uh, Martinez Pada does, to be respectful, okay? Um, okay, uh, so yeah, we got two uh, wonderful answers. And since we, um, since we want to, to actually read the poems today, to continue reading them, I'm going to go to page 52. And please go to page 50, um, 52, uh, the poem is Watch Me Swing. And we are going to uh, read it, read the poem in the same way we did last time, which is to say, one person reads stanza, and then we continue by another person reading the next stanza, okay? Um, so I'm gonna ask, uh, Lindsay, are you there uh, with the Watch Me Swing? Could you start with the first stanza? Yes, I am. I was the fifth man hired for the city welfare cleaning crew at the old Patterson Street ballpark 
Class A minor leagues opening day was over and we wait, raked the wooden benches for the droppings of the crowd. Wrappers, spilled cups, scorecards, popcorn cartons, chewed and spat hot dogs, a whiskey bottle, a condom dried on newspaper. We swung our brooms, um, pausing to watch home. Just one stanza, Lindsay. Just one stanza. Thank oh, you. One stanza. Sorry. All right. It's okay. We, sw we swung our brooms, pausing to watch home runs sail through April imagination over the stone fence 300 feet away. Baseball cracking off the paint factory sign across Washington Street. We shuffled and kicked, plowed and pushed through the clinging garbage, savoring our minimum wages. I'm gonna ask Jimena, next stanza. Jimena is not answering for some reason. Kaylee. Oh, can I'm here. I'm sorry. Oh. I was I was reading it. I just didn't know I <laughs> my bike Please was off. Ahead. Please go ahead. <clears throat> when the sweeping was done and the grandstand benches clean as Sunday morning pews, the team business manager inspected the aisles, reviewing the cleaning crew, standing like broomstick cadets, and said, We only need four. I was the fifth man hired. Yes. So it, sometimes we even have we even have dialogue, right, uh, in the same poem, and we have voices, not necessarily the voice of the poem. In here, as as he writes, we have the voice of uh, uh, the business manager, right, saying we only need four. Okay. As the business manager strode across the outfield back to his office, I wanted to leave the railing crouch at home plate and swing my broom, aiming a smacked baseball for the back of his head, yelling, watch me swing, boss. Watch me swing. Um, okay, one thing that we know about this poem is that this is autobiographical. So when, when, we, when we read I, right? I, I, I. Um, we know that this is a moment in uh, Espada's life. And so he's saying he had a very tough time uh, looking for a job. And he, you know, he barely got a job. And then he was dismissed. Um, so in, in, in this poem, we do have a story, as you can see. We do have a story and we do have a conflict. How would you summarize the conflict here, Kaylee? What is the conflict in the poem? I feel like part of the conflict is like he got laid off, but he wants to do something about it, but he can't. Because like when he says he wants to watch me swing boss, like watch me swing, like he wants to like show his boss that like he can do the job better than maybe some other guys. I think that's a great interpretation. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, and um, I sense impotence, impotence and uh, frustration at the end, a lot of frustration and even when he's saying, watch me swing boss, you know, I, I wanted to aim the, that baseball, right? Uh, for the back of his head, I sense rage as well. But rage that is, you know, uh, creating a picture or a movie in his head that he knows will not take place. So impotence, frustration, frustration. Notice how this poetry also can deal with uh, difficult emotions. Okay, instead of, you know, um, we could have a picture of a poetry being emotional, but at the same time, we can easily idealize poetry and say, oh, poetry just talks about beautiful uh, things and beauty in general. Uh, the challenge I would say in here would be this, 
can we find some kind of beauty in ugliness? Um, I think part of the, the challenge of this poetry is that, that is constantly getting us close to ugliness and trying, and trying to unveil something, okay? And having us, the readers, to deal with that, you know, with, that, with the conflict and with that kind of ugliness taking shape in people's lives, okay? Um, now, I, I, totally, uh, I totally agree with that, with that interpretation. Um, notice also, I think one of the, let me ask you just a simple question. One, what line would you, for, for any reason, one line, okay? Would you highlight in this poem? If you were to choose one line that for you is telling you something, which line would you would you highlight? We only need four. Yes, indeed. Can you explain that? Well, I just thought it was confusing about I was the fifth man. I think that was past tense that I was like he's not now. And that is what leads to the conflict of his frustration of being fired is that he wants to hit his boss with a baseball. It kind of reminds me of that scene from his doubtfire where she grabs the line and she aims for the boyfriend's head. Uh -huh. like, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I wanted to ask a question about that moment in the poem. I thank you for highlighting it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. he, he didn't have a choice, you know. He, what what is implied here is that the business manager, well, had to make a decision first of all, and then had to find a criterion, right, a reason here for making the decision. So he couldn't say, "I like you, and therefore I'm going to sh I'm going to keep you." But the reason he found, according to the poem, was, "Okay, I'm going to fire the person who was." Uh, hired last. And then the poet says, I was the fifth man hired. And that was the business manager's criterion to dismiss him. Maybe, right? Um, like past tense, I was hired. But right. then now he's fired. Well, it's, yes. So instead of the beginning, where it says, I was the fifth man hired, which is also past tense, but that's reclaiming a memory. That's what I think of it as. But when he says that the second time, that means that past tense that he was fired, right? Yeah, but what I would like to highlight, yes, what I would like to highlight is the reason of that uh, the business manager found to fire him. And the reason is not that he doesn't like uh, Martin Espada, has nothing according to the situation it's nothing to do with this. It's just that he was the fifth guy hired for the job. Okay. Uh, so it's kind of like teachers, like most of the time, if you're an older teacher, you stay, and the younger teachers who were just hired leave when it happens like layoffs. Oh, I see. I see. Yes, in difficult situations, and this may pertain to our reality nowadays, right? Uh, with, with lots of unemployment. Uh, yeah, there might be, uh, people might, might be finding reasons to lay people off, as we know, and this has been happening. Uh, and it would be, uh, and we have laws in this country that protect people. So empl employers need to be very careful in finding ways, uh, well, or doing what maybe, maybe they have to do, maybe I'm gonna say, okay? not to give them much power, all the power, because I think we shouldn't. Um, any, any other line, uh, Jaylene? I mean, I was gonna say the, we only need four one because that one really stood out. And then I would probably say like the watch me swing boss, watch me swing. Yes, I would. Yeah, and he himself highlights those too. Uh, yeah, there's one more for me, okay? I'm going to go with the second stanza. Second stanza, uh, this, this is, a, is, is, a, is a line that I would highlight personally. The last line in the second stanza, savoring our minimum wages. But because I, I sense uh, how bitter 
the situation is for those who are working there. That, you know, uh, we're just barely receiving uh, some money for cleaning garbage. Uh, this is, this is not, not exactly a job. It's barely a job, first of all, right? And then, uh, so how do people feel when they are going through something like this? And then it's so, um, what is it, uh, extreme, the situation is so extreme that then the guy comes, right, the business manager, manager and lets him off from something that it's barely a job, barely a job, pays very little, right, minimum wages. So uh, for me, Ms. Patty is saying, I cannot even get this kind of uh, st stupid job. Uh, they, they are gonna fire me right away for, for doing this kind of job. They couldn't even pay me, you know, uh, a, few, a few dollars. Um, so in that sense, the poem is, goes to an extreme to tell you what a person can go through. Again, um, ugliness, okay? Not necessarily beauty. Um, and, but there's a moment of beauty in the poem for me as well. And that moment, I don't want to forget this, is when the, the crew is looking at the baseball games, okay? And we swung our brooms, second stanza, pausing to watch home runs sail through April imagination. So there is something in there, right? That creates a bit more of complexity in the, in sen in the sense of these guys have dreams. They can appreciate beauty, okay? Because for me, watch home runs sail through April imagination. It also pertains to a beautiful moment in their lives. It's like that would be maybe the occasion of escaping, you know, as we, as we know, uh, sports can do that. Um, going into something else and not what they ha have to go through, picking up um, lots of things, you know, from the ground. So I don't want to forget that side of the poem as well because it's important. And of course, the significance of, of uh, baseball for um, part of the Latinx population in the States, um, for Puerto Ricans that can be important, for Dominicans as well, right? Uh, so I don't want to forget that side. Okay, notice how then some of the poems will be autobiographical and you can use that for your paper, okay? On the poetry of Espada. Uh, I want to go now to another uh, sort of autobiographical poem on page 65, 65, 6-5, and the, the, the title is in Spanish, and it's called Colibri, Colibri. <clears throat> For Catherine, one year later. Now, uh, do not dismiss, you know, that dedication, uh, because Catherine uh, was his wife, uh, his first wife, actually. He remarried recently. And so this is, this is a poem for his first wife, for a reason, okay? And we need to find, and here you also have a story, okay? But we need to uh, kind of uh, study the poem to see what is this story about. So let's do the same. Let's read the stanza. I'm going to ask uh, Kaylee to start us with the first stanza, please. And the, the name of the place is Hayuya in Spanish, in Hayuya. In Hayuya, the lizard scattered like a fleet of green chancos, chan how do you say it? Chancos? Canos, canos, canos. Thank you. Before the invader, the Spanish conquistador, con conquered, sorry. Okay. Um, with the iron and words, Indo Tanino? Mm -hmm. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. Uh, for the people who took life from the rain that rushed through trees like evaporating arrows, who left the rocks, carvings the, of the eyes and mouths in perfect circles of amazement. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, the language of the poem is very musical and rhythmic at the same time. Um, Kels, please continue. 
So the hummingbirds were christened Calabri. Calabri. Now the Calabri darts and bangs between the white walls of the Hacienda. Hacienda. A racing Tantino heart. Taino. Taino hard, frantic as if hearing the bellowing god of gunpowder for the first time. Thanks. Uh, one comment. I think I think those hesitations are important. Okay, uh, those hesitations when he goes into Spanish and the names of locations like Hayuya are important because we need to recognize that. When when the person uh, when the person is Latinx, um, he is fluctuating right in terms of languages, and and to really appreciate that person, uh, their own individuality, individuality, but not only individuality. I would say you know heritage. Then we need to go along with that, um, and that for some people is difficult. They don't want to, they don't want, they just would like for English to be, you know, the whole thing. But Espada is adamant about, about his Spanish side, saying, if you, if you want to engage, appreciate me, uh, see me, if, to really see me, you need, you need to also embrace, embrace that side of me, which is, Espanol, right, Spanish, and yes, indeed, English, but it's both. And since I'm, I'm relating myself to Puerto Rico, especially in this poem, right? Um, how I'm going to say something about Puerto Rico without saying colibri? This is his point, right? How I'm going to say uh, something about this situation if I'm not going to mention Hayuya? Plus I love the musicality of the Spanish language. Now, he's not saying to you, listen to me or pay attention to me um, only in Spanish, as you see, right? He's not saying that. He's not talking to us, quote unquote, right? Talking uh, in it, uh, only in Spanish. If not, if, if you mostly you know, understand English, um, then it would be impossible. The communication would not happen. So it's something a bit more sophisticated, if you will, which is fluctuation, okay? Sometimes the Spanish, <clears throat> not always. And yes, indeed English, okay? Um, okay, next stanza. I'm going to ask Jimena, could you uh, read the next stanza? <laughs> Again, Jimena, hello. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Sorry about that. <clears throat> um, I had walked away for a second. Can you let me know what page we're on? I'm sorry. We are on page 66. Okay. The colibri, the colibri becomes pure stillness, seized in paralysis of the prey when your hands cup the bird and lift him through the red shutters of the window, where he disappears into the paradise of sky, a nightfall of singing frogs. If only history were like your Thanks. hands. That's a stanza. It's a stanza per person. Don't, please don't do more than a stanza. Okay, I'm doing that on purpose. Um, and then we have a little stanza at the end of the poem, right? If only history were like your hands. Okay, I want to concentrate on this you. So we have a you here in the poem, right? When your hands cap the bird, and then if only history were like your hands, let's go back to page 65. Let's see if we find one more you. Oh, the first stanza is descriptive, right? So it's third person. And then the second stanza, the same. So only in the third stanza we have that you. Who is that you, Jalen? Obviously. His wife. 
Exactly, it's Catherine. So in the third stanza, fourth stanza, or the end of the poem, he's talking to Catherine. Now, can you, after reading the poem, can you tell me what is the story about? The simple story, the anecdote, okay? That's, that's probably a good uh, word here for describing some of his poems. He works on, on anecdotes. Uh, Kaylee, what is the anecdote, the story here, basically? I am not sure. Okay, let me give you the beginning and you somebody give me the, the uh, next part of the anecdote. Uh, Catherine and Martin, and they live in say Boston, okay? Or nearby, that's where they live. That's the beginning. What else should we say? He's comparing his wife to a hummingbird and how she is, well, this is my opinion, how she's basically busying herself like a hummingbird does, rushing back and forth. And in a hacienda is a flower, I believe. Oh, it's a farm. And Calibre. It's a farm. Oh, it's a farm. It's, it's oh, a farm. My, yes. My bad. No problem. But yeah, the farms we kind of rush here as well. Um, and Calibre, I looked up in the glossary, means hummingbird in Spanish. Uh, yes, he translates it, translated in the poem itself when he says, so the, so the hummingbird, when he wrote, so the hummingbird was christened Colibri. There you have the translation. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's in the poem itself. But what is the story? Are you still, um, so they both, Catherine and Martin, you know, uh, live here, this side of the country, more or less. What took place? I'm not talking about an interpretation of the poem, I'm just talking about the story. What took place? Anybody, Kels, what took place? I really have no clue either. <laughs> um, do you have any questions? Is there something obscure in the poem that you cannot understand? If so, could you give me a question? Would the poem be about the divorce and how Catherine took the kids with her? Okay, uh, my answer would be if you, if you can find proof of that in the poem, yes. But if you cannot, if we cannot find proof of that, no way, Jose. Oh, okay. okay. Is could it be um because when you look at the last stanza, it says if only history were like your hands, and then in the first stanza it says the Spanish conquered with iron words Indio Taino. So is it talking about like the like the the con like the conquer of um Puerto Rico back in like before? Uh, yes, but that's interpretation. That's an excellent you know, point that you're making. Yes, the poem is all about that. Yes. Uh, but my question is more basic. What is the anecdote? What is the story? Okay. Um, well, let's begin again. In Hayuya, the lizards scatter like a fleet of green canoes before the invader. What is happening? They both, Catherine and Martin Espada, husband and wife, travel to Puerto Rico. And this is a location in Puerto Rico, right? And they're looking at the lizards, right? Uh, and this is kind of, and this is, this triggers in, in Martinez Pada, uh, the memory recollection about history in Puerto Rico. So uh, Jaylene, there you have the association, but the anecdote is, okay, they were here, right? Say somewhere here in the States. And then they travel over to the island, to the other side. And they go to Hayuya and they're looking at lizards. And then he starts reflecting on history, right? On the history, yes. The Spanish conquered with iron and wars. So here colonization. Indio Taino for the people who took life from the rain that rushed through the trees. 
So what did they do? Let's stay with this stanza. What did they, uh, the Spaniards did? What did they do? When it says in here, in Utaino for the people who took life. What, what is it that they, they did? Jimena. Kaylee. Um, people came in and took their land that they had. Yeah. Uh, well, it says with iron, so that's uh, exploitation, right? And then notice it says wars, Indio Taino for the people who took life. They named the people. They gave them names in Spanish. And that was not, wasn't the language of the inhabitants of the island. So they are naming. And by naming, they are exercising power over uh, the indigenous population. So yes, guns, but also language the language of the conquest, right? And then we have a beautiful description of the Taino people, actually, Tainos, the uh, people who took life from the rain that rushed through trees like evaporating arrows, who left, who left. So these are the indigenous population. They left the rock carvings. So if you go to Puerto Rico, you'll find the carvings, the rocks uh, of eyes and mouth in perfect circles of amazement, okay? in perfect circles of amazement. So that's what you look at when you, when you see, you know, when you see kind of people maybe or animals that look at you with this kind of amazement in their faces, okay? Um, so beauty, we're back to beauty, okay? But also we are back to history and imposition, exploitation and naming. Because uh, this, is, this, is uh, this is a power that uh, you know, the powerful may have, naming things and people the way they want because they are conquering people. But back to the anecdote, right? They travel from this side to the country to the other side and they are at Hayuya. Now, um, what happens when they go to the farm? They stayed at, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, I. Uh, sort of an apartment, a house that they rent. Notice, this is the anecdote. They are renting a house or something, right? And they're inside the house. What do they see inside the house all of the sudden? Notice how simple my question is. It's not a, nothing, you know, philosophical. What is it that they see? inside the house. Kels, what do they see? Uh, white walls. Yes. And what is crashing against the walls? Um, oh, it's one of the translations, isn't it? What is crashing against, what is crashing against the walls? That's the, the hummingbird? Yes, they are looking at the hummingbird. That's the anecdote, right? Oh, so the humming, okay. So they walk into the house and the hummingbird is hitting the walls, okay. Yeah, because it's frankly, frantically trying to. It's is, escape. Exactly. If you understand that, you understood the poem. Right, the okay. colibri is trying to escape, right? Um, darts and bangs. Um, and notice the connection he makes, the poet, between the colibri, hummingbird, and the indigenous population. All of a sudden he says, racing, Taino, hard, frantic, frantic. So what he sees in the colibri, and this is interpretation, more or less, right? Uh, he sees history. He sees the vibrancy of the people who were there from the beginning, okay? Before the Spaniards came to conquer uh, Puerto Rico. Uh, so it's alive, right? And also it needs to escape from the hacienda. It needs to go out 
because it doesn't belong in this prison, right? It's been in prison for some reason, right? Um, then uh, let's go to page 66. And let's, let's read this again, okay? Uh, this is a beautiful, beautiful poem, I think. I, I really like it. Um, Jaylene, could you read the stanza again? The stanza that Kimena read? The colibri becomes pure stillness, sees in paralysis of the prey, when your hands cup the bird and lift him through the red shutters of the window, where he disappears into paradise of sky, a nightfall of singing frogs. Yes, so here we have a doer, we have agency. We have somebody doing something. And this is part of the anecdote. Kaylee, what did someone, what took place? Um. The bird like fell to the ground because it says it paralyzed, paralyzed. I'm not really sure. Uh, read at the, if you read the, the next lines, you'll see that it's very, the poem is very explicit. It says, when your hands cap the bird and lift him through the red shutters of the window where he disappears into a paradise of skies. He was so, set free. Who did it? Um, he did. It says you, right? It says when your hands cap the bird. Oh, so his wife. Totally important here, okay, for the for the situation. So notice, and uh, and then of course uh, the the colibri hummingbird is released into a paradise of the sky because because of the beauty of Puerto Rico, okay? A night fall, so it was at night also, when this took place. A night fall, fall of singing frogs. And Puerto Rico is known for its frogs, right? Uh, the, the name is coqui, coqui, frogs. It's like the national, what is it, animal of Puerto Rico, okay? A coqui or, or frogs. Um, so notice the anecdote. They were here, they wanted, they wanted to have a good vacation. So they said to themselves, let's go to Puerto Rico. So they go to Hayuya, they get to the hacienda and go inside or at night, I don't know, they get to see the, the hummingbird uh, desperate, trying frantically to go out. And then somebody makes a decision and that somebody is not Martin Espada, it's his wife caps the bird, you know, inside her hands and takes the, 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 the colibri outside and releases the, the colibri or hummingbird into a paradise. And that's what the poet does, right? Creates metaphors, paradise of the sky. But that's, that paradise, of course, is Puerto Rico, right? And then we kind of have, uh, for the resolution of the poem, uh, kind of a reflection, right? a sort of thought, main point, or even if you wanna call it, I, mean, I don't like it too much, but if you wanna call it the moral of the story, okay, kind of the lesson of the story at the end, uh, when he says, if only history were like your hands. And now we need interpretation. If only someone like freed those who were captured by the Spanish conquistadors? Yes. You have the main point of the story now. Because we have the anecdote, right? The story itself. And then, yes. Uh, I wish, I wish history were like your hands. It's a kind of a comparison here, or connection, right? Between her hands. Notice, liberation, and this, this is the beauty of the poem. Liberation from the here comes from the wife's hands, from the action that she performs, not the poem. The poet is the witness. So poets, somehow, I would argue, Martinez Spain's Spada is saying, poets need, need to be witnesses, okay? And act like that and 
by being a witness, uh, when you tell your story, you can kind of envision through your imagination and through your metaphor, something else, a different kind of history or uh, a different ending or an atrocious history that has taken place. In this case, the beauty is that maybe the force of liberation will come through the agency of women. Uh, women uh, will have a lot to do with freedom and freeing those who are, as Lindsay is saying, you know, imprisoned. Okay. Uh, and one more, one more comment here I, I would like to make, unless you, I'm sorry, unless you have a comment that you'd like to make. I want, to, I want to make a comment about fragility and being fragile, okay? Because the, there is a connection between the hummingbird, right? Being such a tiny, small, fragile uh, bird and also the Taino heart. So when she liberates the bird, she's liberating, as Jaylene already suggested, she, she's uh, liberating the Taino, the Taino heart that is, you know, pulsing, that is vibrating, that has, has its own, um, what is it? Uh, um, pulsation, but vibrancy, I want to say, okay? It's like the core of the Puerto Rican culture, maybe at least this side of the culture, right? Not the African, Afro-Latino, Afro-Latino side. Um, but notice the fragility, okay? She could crush the bird, but she chooses not to do that. So maybe my point is here for, for us to uh, have this uh, opportunity to liberate, we need to deal in fragility. We need to be experts at fragility uh, and behave in, in such a way that we do not destroy what we want to when we need to protect. Uh, that's part of my interpretation for the poem too. And who can do it? it? It looks like the poet cannot, but his wife can. So there is an interesting connection between then husband, right? male and female for the poem, which is some, something that I wanted to share with you, okay? What, how does he see uh, the female side of the world? And does he give, uh, does he appreciate uh, the female side of the world as having agency as opposed to be victims, right? Agency. And I see a lot of agency here in, in, this, in this beautiful poem. Okay. Okay. Next, next poem, sixty-seven. Bully. Um, I was about um, avoiding this poem um, because I think it's kind of a uh, on your face, an in your face, you know, type of uh, depiction of a situation. But I just want to make a point uh, by choosing uh, to read it along with you uh, because I think it's important for his poetry and for this question. What kind of poetry does he want to write? And why is he writing poetry? If we, if we read this poem, I think it will be more clear that he's got one, one more reason. But already with Colibri or Hummingbird, we already have the answer, okay? But uh, let's go uh, over Bully. Boston, Massachusetts, uh, 1987. Um, I'm going to ask, is Jimena here? I don't have an answer uh, from Jimena. So I'm going to say, Lindsay, could you start, start, start us with the first stanza? Yeah. In the school auditorium, the Theodore Roosevelt statue is nostalgic for the Spanish-American War. Each fist lonely for his saber or the reins of an anguish-eyed horse. Horses. Or a podium to clatter with speeches glorifying in the malaria of conquest. Thanks. Kels, please continue. But now. <clears throat> but now the Roosevelt School is pronounced 
Hernandez. Yes. Yes. Puerto Rico has invaded Roosevelt with its army of Spanish singing children in the hallways, brown children devouring the stockpiles of the cafeteria, children painting ten Tatino and ancestors who leap naked across murals. Yes, Taino, Taino ancestors who leap naked across murals, yes. Roosevelt is surrounded by all the faces he ever shoved in eugenic spite and cursed as mongrel skin of one race, hair and cheekbones of another. Next page. Kaylee, please read the last uh, segment. Once Marines tramped from the news reel of his immigration, new children plot to spray Griffith Griffith, as I say it? Graffiti. Mm -hmm. Graffiti, sorry. Uh, and uh, por, Poroso, Parto, Partero? Parrot. Par I think it's Parrot. Parrot. Brilliant colors. Um, brilliant colors across the Victorian mustache of the man Monocle. Monocle. Monocle, Monocle. yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay, uh, since you hesitated, Kaylee, what is a what is a monocle? A monocle, it's like, isn't it um almost like a little circle glass like you read out of? Yes, it? exactly. That you put right here in your face. Yeah. It's your glasses. Used to be, you know, your glasses. Um, yeah. Um, okay. So uh, simply said, this this poem is about it seems to be uh, uh, about uh, Theodore. Theodore uh, Roosevelt. The question I have for you is this one. Didn't you... um, Sorry, I just got an idea of why it's called Bully, maybe. Go ahead. Because okay. wasn't that one of the catchphrases was Bully? Catchphrases uh, phrases, uh, when, uh, I don't. Something he's been known to say sometimes. Uh, oh, Roosevelt himself? I think so. Okay. Um, the questions I have it's are, basically... are two. I have two questions. Hmm. Sorry, I'm gonna I'm gonna continue. One question is who was right. Theodore Roosevelt? Maybe this has to do with what you're saying, Lindsay. Uh, one, who was Theor Theodore uh, Theodore uh, Roosevelt? And secondly, how does the poem present Theo Theodore Roosevelt to us? That's Theodore the Roosevelt was, was one of our presidents and he was also a rough rider. Okay. What is the connection between Roosevelt and, and, uh, and Puerto Rico, Jalen? Um, I'm not quite sure what the connection is, but in the second uh, stanza, it says Puerto Rico has invaded Roosevelt. So I guess um, the people of like the school are, wait, yeah, the school, um, they're retaking back what they lost. Yes, yes. And that's the, the... the main thrust of the poem, I would say, okay? Um, so notice I'm gonna use again my word, agency. Now, agency is, I don't see it coming from uh, women, but from children, and those are Puerto Rican children. So the point here is, uh, sometimes in his poetry, you see people who are being victimized, right? But careful, because we need to take a look at the other side of the moon in here, okay? Which is, do people have agency? If, you have, if, if they are working class, if they are unemployed, do they have some kind of agency? Even in the previous poem, when we were seeing that he was unemployed, he was dismissed from his job, laid off, fired, he still had anger. He couldn't act on it, he wouldn't, right? But he expresses that emotion. Even there, I would argue, we have agency. We don't necessarily have only victimization, okay? And this is very important for me because usually, I think there is, there is this tendency, okay, uh, of portraying people who 
are uh, under difficult circumstances simply as victims. And this is a major topic in America, right? A major topic historically. Uh, victims as opposed to victim, uh, victimizers, right? And oppressors as opposed to oppressed, enslavers as opposed to slaves. So we're talking about a major topic indeed in history, right? Um, but I think I would argue that throughout this poetry, we, we also have a tremendous sense of agency, which can be kind of subtle at times, okay? Uh, not kind of that obvious in your face, if you will, but that it, it appears, that appears from time here and there and continuously, okay? So we need to be careful about that too, uh, appreciating agency. Uh, as opposed to simply victimization, okay, as, I, as I'm saying. But so the children are taking over Roosevelt. So who is Roosevelt in this poem, okay, in this poem? Well, if you read uh, the third stanza. Now, now I understand. It's not, um, bully is not, it, it was never a catchphrase or what he used to say. They're saying he was the bully. The children are taking over the bully. Okay, I'm I'm go. so sorry. It took a while for me to connect. But that's no, that's no, that's great. That's the main point of the poem, exactly. But no, they're taking everything back that was that Roosevelt took from the Spanish American War. That's why it says Theodore Roosevelt statue is nostalgic, and nostalgia is something a reminder of something something that reminds you of something that happened in the past that you remember very well yes. for the American Spanish War. Now I understand it. Yes, so when I asked the question about what is the connection between Roosevelt and Puerto Rico, well, the Spanish-American War. And mm -hmm. when uh, Puerto Rico became part of the territory of the United States. So, um, one important question, now you got the, the idea of the poem, okay, the main idea. But th what I wanted to say was that notice what Martinez Pada is, is doing. And I'm going to go back to this question. Why is he writing poetry? And what kind of poetry is interested in writing? Um, my point here, my answer would be, he is interested in telling a different history or retelling history. and. Um, becoming a sort of historian for the voices that ha have not been heard. And this is very, very strong here in this poem, okay? Because many people in America may, may, may see Roosevelt as, you know, the welcomer of a new era for America. The person who expanded, right? The conception or the notion of America for Americans. Now, coming from the side of Espada, he's, this is very blunt even in his poem right here. He's saying there is an, an official, an unofficial uh, history that we need to tell. We, Latinx poets, Puerto Rican poets. And in my case, you know, I'm going to uh, paint a different picture of Roosevelt. Yes, you may be acquainted with that, you know, beautiful description of what Roosevelt did for Americans, but I'm going to tell you my side. And if I don't talk about history or situations, you know, and I place them in history uh, within a historical context, then I'm going to be lying to you. I'm going to be lying. lying. Something, something similar to Christopher Columbus, sort yeah. of like how they, put, but Back then they portrayed him as this hero, but now we know from other people's perspective, now we view him as a antagonist, a bad guy. Yes, and what I would highlight is the clash, the clash between different interpretation of historical figures. And, those, and the, the clash has to do with values, right? And different understandings of history. And, uh, but what I would like to say is also, that in this poetry then, notice, again, I'm going back to the question uh, about why does he write poetry or what kind of poetry uh, he thinks he needs to write. 
or he needs to write. I cannot even think, but he writes, he needs to write. Um, it's a, it's a, a poem or poetry, I'm sorry, that is connected his, to history. He, it's gotta be connected to history, okay? To truly represent Puerto Ricans and Puerto Rican reality. Um, and when we say history, we are saying uh, a history that has been hidden according to him, hidden, okay? Um, when I was saying that he was kind of brutally depicting uh, Roosevelt, notice what he says in the third stanza. Roosevelt is surrounded by all the faces he ever showed in eugenic spite. So he's saying to me, uh, Roosevelt despised Puerto Ricans, despised Puerto Ricans. What, how did Roosevelt portray them? As mongrels, mongrels. What does it mean? The explanation is right there. The skin of one race, hair and cheekbones of another. Skin of one race, hair and cheekbones of another. So mixed people, mixed people, mongrels, okay? But this is a very negative word, okay? A very negative word, mongrel. So, um, so I wanted to ask you if anybody knows uh, what does eugenic mean? Eugenic or eugenics. If not, could somebody uh, look it up and tell us what does eugenic or eugenics mean? It says, um... I had to look it up because I didn't know. Um, it says relating to or fitted for the production of good offspring. Uh, could you repeat it again? Uh, yes, relating to or fitted for the production of good offspring. So I guess kind of like, not. Okay. No, I guess ahead. trying. I guess trying to like. That's too soft. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Comment. That's too soft. It is. I guess like. Uh, what I'm trying to say is kind of like making a, not an identity, but a new duplicate of a person in a sense, maybe kind of like, cause it's, cause the definition says fitted for the production of good offspring. So like you're trying to find the best person to create something with that's, maybe? That's not a good description of Eugene. No? I have okay. to say it, it flat out. It's it, not a good description, no, the, or definition. Okay. Eugenics kind of remind me of how dog breeders breed their dogs they want to have the best looking dogs mm -hmm. so they they breed them but a mongrel is a mixed breed or a mutt mm -hmm. a separate breed to make one so that's what eugenics reminds me of because usually don't dog breeders want purebreds because purebreds are usually accepted and kennel shows and the the West Chestminster Westminster dog show or something like that because they're okay. they're breeding for <laughs> let me stop you right there. Okay, Lindsay, great. What you have said is great. Okay. Um because you mentioned uh several times the word pure and that's very important in this conversation about eugenics. Kels, do you okay. have any idea what we are talking about here? I sort of uh, have an idea, I guess. Please say it, because we haven't said it yet, but it's coming out. Um, I feel like it probably means like that um, you were populate a lot, you know, like. Mm -hmm. In which fashion? Because um. eugenics, eugenics is directing um, or shaping the way people will be. I looked it up and I got selectively mating people with uh, specific desirable heritage traits. So you're like selecting variable traits. Mm -hmm. As Lindsay was describing for dogs. Mm -hmm. What if you do that for popu for populations, for people? I need a comment on that. 
That's Keep like that. selective you're, you're reading. You're welcome to write on, in the chat, okay? If, you're, if you cannot talk to us for some reason, you are welcome to write in the chat. Uh, yes, I'm sorry, Kels. I said it's like selective reading, kind of, you know, like. Yes, very good. Lindsay and Jaylene were already, and Kaylee. So what is happening, Kels? What, what are we talking about? That's it. Can you connect it to some something historically? Mm, not, not really. I'm drawing Let a blank. Let me give you a clue. Uh, eugenics was, quote unquote, a science that was um, very popular in the States at the beginning of the 20th century. It was to be the science. So you can have people like maybe live longer and have like traits that will help them like survive maybe? That's the beautiful side of the uh, description. We need the ugly side. Inbred? What do you mean by that? Uh. <laughs> Basically, meeting mating with someone that is in your family. That's what inbred is. Um, not in your family? Kind of like keeping the blood, kind of like keeping the blood pure in royal families. There you go. You're getting closer and closer. They want to keep everyone looking the same. There you go. Yes, we're getting closer and closer. Yes, and you know about the one drop of blood, right? Rule in the States. You know what I'm talking about? The one drop of blood that makes you someone? I don't think so. No. Nobody does? Uh, the one drop of blood uh, entail in the United States that if you had one um, drop of blood, black blood, you were black. I'm going to repeat it. If you had one drop of uh, black blood, you were black. You're black. So let me go back to your descriptions. So if we are thinking that we need to um, create some kind of uh, population, we may decide that it would be awful that you mix with people who have a different type of blood. You see what so I mean? So what you're meaning is no interracial couples? It was forbidden, yes, in the United States. There were laws against that, that, uh, um, you know, and we, we, I think some of them are still in place because they, uh, they have not been deleted, although they are not enforced, but yes. And, and that's um, anti, anti-miscegenation laws. That, that's the, the terminal, the legal term, anti-miscegenation laws, miscegenation, meaning mixing of people. And of course, since, since this was a ra racist policy, it was, uh, it, was making, it was making sure that we would keep this side, right, of the race, uh, racial spectrum, and we would not mix with the other side that had that one drop of black uh, blood. It's very, it's, it gets complicated because uh, you may be looking at me, right? And I have my one uh, drop, black uh, drop of blood. What if I look white, totally white? My looks, you know, my appearance. Um, who is going to tell me that I'm black? Well, th that, that ruling, right? That ruling is, is the one. Um, so what I was trying to get at, as you were describing the situation of, uh, this is the ugly side of eugenics. And let, me, and let me share with you something else, which is important for you to know. 
Uh, yes, uh, Kaylee, we are talking about anti-miscegenation laws. And there you have in the chat the, the way it is spelled, no mixing of different races. It yes. sounds very similar to what I said about purebreed because yes. there are certain people who want, okay, I want this exactly to be purebred because they're more important and valuable and will most likely be accepted. Uh, and mm -hmm. yes. that, that is what I think because yes. there are some people who don't want mongrels. They yes. want a purebred. All of it is the exact same breed as the parents and their parents for them and their parents for them and so on and so, so forth. My question for you all would be, for you all would be, who used eugenics historically in the 20th century? Who was applying it? Notice it's an, it, it was exported from the United States. Many people don't know that, okay? Eugenics was exported from the United States to a different country because they started believing that this was the science and this was to preserve, as Lindsay is saying, the purity of the race. Um, would that country be Germany? Yes. Meaning the science the Adolf Hitler conducted because yes. he wanted a certain race of people, blonde, blonde hair, blue eyes. He wanted everyone to be like that. Hitler's yeah. perfect child. Yeah, that's that's it. But the connection between you know what was taking place here in the States and what took place in Germany, it's usually hidden usually hidden, hidden. But look up eugenics and you'll see where was it created and then how it was applied in, in Nazi Germany. And you'll see that is, uh, that, that's a historical, uh, what is it, Ex Con export, I don't know, export of sorts, you know, that they used to, to create their own model of society in, in Nazi Germany. Um, and I was saying, let's go back to the poem. Now that we have all this information, notice how uh, Martin Espada is saying that Roosevelt was supportive of eugenics. Okay. That Roosevelt was supportive of eugenics at the time. Okay, at the time. And so he's saying basically that Roosevelt was a racist. Many people in America may say, okay, let me, let me think twice about that and so on and so forth. But uh, Spada is blatant in saying, that's the way it was. And now we have, but now we have agency coming from children, coming from parents who are placing, right? In this school, uh, Puerto Rican parents uh, placing their kids in this school and taking it over. And of course, this, the school here is a symbol, right? of society, institutions, and the reality of the United States, and, and the ex change in terms of demographics. But also, right, the spirit of this, the, of this, of this uh, community that is taking over, right, uh, the school, and infusing it with a different li life and shape, culture, values, and so on and so forth. Uh, so, um, the point was then Espada wants to uh, tell a different story or tell history otherwise, because there is an official history for him and there is this unofficial history that he also wants to um, convey through his poetry. And one more fact that you are not, uh, that you don't know, okay? The, one more fact about Espada's life. When he went to college, like you guys are, you know, right now, he majored in history. That was his major, history. It wasn't literature, it was history. And notice then he becomes a lawyer, right? So he never went uh, to college to study necessarily poetry. Along the way he found poetry and he started writing poetry. And then he becomes one, right, a poet. But I think initially he might wanted to be a lawyer and so he, he shows uh, history as his major, as his major. So that's why he also includes in his poetry, you know, uh, this, this connection between history and the lives of people, experiences of people. 
Um, I wonder if we have time or am I, we have, oh, I'm so sorry. I went over my time. Didn't do it on purpose, but I'm guilty. Okay, I'll see you. I'll see you Thursday with, uh, with our letters, with your letters, and I will be delighted to be listening to what you have to say. If you have a question or comment or something, stay with me. Okay, have a, have a great day. Have a good day, Professor. Take care. I have